Okay, I think we'll start, and I'm glad to hear the mic is on. My name is Bill Bird. I'm with the U.S. Institute of Peace, and uh, this panel is on the political economy aspects of transition, and I hope we'll actually, with a, a very uh, distinguished uh, group of panelists, get into deeper some of the somewhat neglected political economy aspects and how they might interact with the uh, uh, politics in Afghanistan and also the conflict. So I won't spend a lot of time introducing the panelists, but uh, whose bios are available uh, on the handout that was, uh, that was outside. But uh, Anand Gopal is the Bernard L. Schwartz Fellow at the New American Foundation and has been uh, working on conflict issues in Afghanistan. Matthew Akins is uh, based in Kabul, has written a number of articles and papers on for Harper's and others, including uh, uh, think, uh, p very interesting pieces on uh, private sector security companies and the economic aspects of transition. Barani Penn is the senior economic advisor for the United States International, sorry, USAID, uh, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan office. Now, I was originally supposed to be a panelist and had actually prepared some remar remarks when I, had, I was told I had to take over as moderator. Uh, each of our panelists will talk 15 minutes, but I think I'll start things off with just a couple of points to maybe set the stage. Basically, we're talking about the impact of economic changes and particularly my, uh, uh, financial flows on the political economy in Afghanistan. So when you're looking at the economics of transition, you can look at the direct economic impact. There was a major World Bank report on that, whose findings were, were basically that economic growth would slow down a great deal, but that there would not uh, necessarily be an economic collapse during transition. However, uh, that report made two big assumptions. Uh, particularly that the political and the security situation would be stable and would not uh, deteriorate. And basically, you can imagine uh, the important role of confidence in, in what happens economically as well as uh, politically is, is extremely important. I, uh, we don't need to belabor that because uh, a relatively small problem of uh, credit default swaps and subprime mortgages caused almost the world economy to collapse. So why on earth would we expect uh, confidence not to be just as important during the major changes that Afghanistan is going through? Um, and you, you, you can associate that with several things, but one would be the level of the continuing international commitment to Afghanistan, including troops that might affect confidence and of course political uncertainty and potential political instability. And, and these things would then sort of wipe out those kind of uh, moderate findings of the World Bank transition report because, as I said, they assumed that there's not a drastic decline in confidence. So, so the key question I think this panel will try to address is uh, how will changing financial flows, and in particular the sharply declining international military expenditures and aid, affect the interests and incentives of political elites and political actors in Afghanistan, and uh, how would that affect prospects for uh, stability and risks of conflict? I think uh, at the risk of, of becoming a panelist myself, I think I will uh, not say anything further at this point uh, and uh, instead turn it over to Anand. Thanks. Um, I, I was happy to hear Ambassador Samad mentioned that we need to learn from history and history can be a guide for what's coming up in the future. So in, in that spirit, um, I'd like to start the discussion about the transition by going back in time to 10 years ago. So the date's 2002, that's 11 years ago. Uh, the province is Urzgan province. And if you don't know where Urzgan is, it's in, it's in southern Afghanistan. It's a bordering Kandahar province. In Ur is gone in 2002, there was a man named Pai Muhammad. Uh, he was a, a tribal elder and a, no, a local notable. He, he was at home one day when Afghan soldiers, and by that I mean people who worked for the governor of Ur is gone province, uh, 
broke into his home and forced him out at gunpoint into his courtyard. They also forced out every other fighting aged male in the house, um, his cousins, his brothers, etc., into the courtyard. Uh, one of the commanders there uh, called the governor, and the governor's name is John Muhammad Khan. Uh, the Americans affectionately called him JMK. Uh, called JMK on the phone and said, we have Pai Muhammad here, what should we do? And he listened. And then he heard the reply and he said, okay. And he took a gun to Pai Muhammad's head and shot him. Shot him dead. And he went back to, uh, to JMK on the phone and said, did you hear that? You know, after the shooting, the other men there, his relatives, started screaming and crying. And, and, and so the, the soldiers there got upset and they tied the men down uh, and tied them down with ropes and stones. They left one man standing and tied everybody else with ropes and stones on the ground. Then they took their jeep and they drove over the men back and forth until their bones were crushed. And then they took the lifeless bodies and dumped them into the back of the pickup truck. And they drove the, uh, the pickup truck with the bodies into Tirinko, which is the capital of Erzgan province, into the town square, the center. And they dumped the bodies there. Now, of course, the, the merchants and the people in the, in the town went and, uh, and saw these bodies, and they were horrified, and they wanted to go and bury these bodies as soon as possible. But the, the soldiers said, you cannot touch these bodies. These bodies will remain here. And they remained there, rotting under the, under the sun for three days. Of course, there's a lot of violence in Afghanistan, and there's rivalries, and it's complex, and, uh, and ultimately, this goes back to a rivalry between JMK and this person, Pai Muhammad. But the, the question that struck me when I first learned the story is, why dump their bodies? Why not just kill them and bury them? What's the, what's the, what's the purpose of dumping their bodies ceremoniously in the square for everybody to see for three days? And the answer, I believe, is because JMK understood something that, that most of us don't understand and, and uh, definitely we didn't understand at the time, which is that the violence that he's enacting is communicative, is performative. He's trying, to, he's trying to put forth a message. And the message, ultimately, if you boil it down, is about access. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But I think so much of what we see in Afghanistan today, so much of the, war, uh, the violence that we see, is, hinges upon questions of access. And, and so, to, to explain what I mean by that, what do I mean by access? Imagine you're in a village in this province of Urzgan. It's an extremely rural province, okay? And let's say, uh, you know, you have a, a dirt or macadam road that's coming through your province, and, and you want to pave the road. You want the government to pave your road. So what do you do? Okay, you go to your village elders, you go to the tribal leaders, etc. cetera. Uh, there's no municipality for most of these places. There may be a village council in these places. And you ask them, can you, can you petition the government to pave this road? Now, the, the municipality can't uh, pave it on their own because they don't collect taxes. There's no tax extraction from, from ordinary populations, right? They have to rely on somebody uh, above them, either foreign donors or from the state, from Kabul, which themselves will rely ultimately on foreign donors. And so they'll ask uh, Kabul to send them resources, to send them funds to go pave this road. However, Afghanistan is, uh, is not really a state in, in the sense that we think about it uh, in the West with a impersonal bureaucracy, with, with uh, civil service, mass civil service that extends out into the countryside. It's, it's governed very heavily by the politics of informal society in the sense that you should know the right person. You should have some sort of connection with the right person in government to be able to get, get the resources you need. And so in, another way of saying this is that the, the network in which, which you're embedded in can make the difference between whether you get this road paved or not. And by network, that could be a tribal network, that could be a friendship network. For instance, suppose you fought in the jihad in the 80s against the Soviets and you know, somebody you, you fought with uh, is now in the Ministry of Finance or uh, so on and so forth. These networks, uh, these, what I like to call networks of access, these are the networks that, that really are, the, I think, are the most important in terms of how patronage from the center, from Kabul, gets distributed out into the periphery. And so when John Muhammad Khan kills Pai Muhammad, um, and he kills him in such a way, he's doing a number of things. Because Pai Muhammad wasn't just an ordinary person. Pai Muhammad was an important tribal elder. He, he's from a group of tribes that are collectively known as the Gilgai tribes. Um, and he played a very important role. He was somebody who, supported the, uh, who came around and supported the American intervention after 2001 and was seeking uh, a way to support the Karzai government. Uh, 
and he played a, a very important role in connecting ordinary villagers to the Afghan government and potentially to the Americans. And what, John, uh, what, J, what JMK, the governor that the Americans had backed, what JMK understood is that to, to monopolize access to either Kabul or to the foreigners, you need to eliminate competition. And people like Pai Muhammad were competition. And so what you saw throughout 2001, 2002, 2003 was the wholesale slaughter, imprisonment, and, um, and dri literally driving people out of the province of, of the elite of the Gilgai tribes in Urizgan province. To the, to the point where you had whole communities all across Urizgan province which are severed from the center and which were severed from access to American patronage. And it's those very same communities. If you, were able, if you were to map today where the insurgency has the strongest roots, where the insurgency has, if, if you could actually say, a natural constituency, it would be these same communities. And, and you know, when I say this, it's important. I, mean, I mentioned the Gilgais. Um, it happened to be that this was the Gilgais versus non-Gilgais in, in Uruzgan. That's not the case in other provinces. You know, in Kandahar, it's a different set of tribes. Uh, in in ba Badgis province in the north in the northwest, it's not even about tribes. It's Pashtuns versus non-Pashtuns. You know, it, the the actual fault lines of fragmentation differ, and this is why you know, explanations um, that this is an insurgency that's about Pashtun nationalism or about tribal it's a tribal insurgency are, are too simplistic. I think right. What it's actually about is networks. Uh, looking to access resources in, in, in circumstances in which a state is very weak um, and, and it's very difficult to, to make ends meet in any other way. Um, and so this looks different everywhere you look. So the Taliban insurgency looks very different um, and it's, it hinges and it's built upon local rivalries, but those rivalries may be different. So it's, it's very difficult to draw an overarching sort of theme except to say that these are all communities, communities which are now which the Taliban have the, have the strongest roots, are all communities in which they have been squeezed out of state access and they have been squeezed out of access from foreign patronage. Now that, that matters in a very fundamental way looking forward um, past 2014. Uh, but before I explain why that's the case, I want to take a step back first and go, and go even further into history. Um, back, back before 1979, now, you know, people talk a lot in Afghanistan about warlords and commanders, and, and it, you know, it's, you can read the news and think that this phenomenon of warlordism is something that's endemic to Afghanistan. It's part of the DNA of Afghanistan. I believe it's not. I believe warlordism in Afghanistan is a modern phenomenon that dates from 1979 and onwards. And, and that's intimately tied to this idea of access and, 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 and uh, networks of access. So before 1979, let's say the 60s or 50s, if you were in this village in Orzgan and you wanted to build this road, now who would you go to? Again, you have the same sort of model where the, 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 you know, the village elders are not raising taxes and you know, they're still ultimately getting their funds from, from outside. Okay? However, um, you have a set of actors who act as what I would call brokers, in a brokerage position between the population and the center, between Kabul. Okay? These would be uh, village heads, we would call Maliks, uh, would be landlords, like Khans, uh, these would be tribal elders. These people occupy a brokerage position. And so if you wanted, uh, if you wanted um, anything from, if you wanted uh, money to, to get married, to if you wanted uh, state services, these are the sorts of people that you would appeal to in, or in this village in Oregon. Now, the, the communist coup in 1978 and the Soviet invasion in 1979 irrevocably changed this dynamic. It did so in two ways. The first is that the, the communists, uh, the Afghan communists and the Soviets after them killed or displaced whole sections of this sort of brokerage class, if you, if you think of it in that way. Um, and in their place, you, you saw a new group of brokers arise. But that wasn't the only story, okay, that's part of it. And the other story is the massive amounts of weapons and money that the United States, via Pakistan and others, was sending into Afghanistan. So in other words, the CIA was now acting as a second sort of Kabul, a second sort of state, and sending money and, and patronage into Afghanistan. And so what you had is a, uh, a bifurcation of sorts, where you had a turnover of the old brokerage class uh, into a, a new set of actors. Again, there could be the new village heads, the new tribal elders, et cetera, but they were, they were new people. They were not the same as the earlier people. 
And then you also had a new type of actor, which, which really doesn't have a, a much precedence in Afghan history. And, and this type of actor is, it was somebody who got all of their resources and, the, and ultimately their power from their access to foreign patronage, uh, from guns and money. And then this is, this is the Mujahideen, essentially. Um, and, and these were strong, you know, these became strong men or warlords or commanders. I, I think commander is the best term. It's a term that the Afghans use, commandan. And, and this is, I think, the best term for it because it encompasses all, all, all of these possibilities. So you had, a, in addition to the tribal networks and, and various other networks that existed, you had a new type of network that, are, that arose due to CIA patronage ultimately, which is the commander network. And, and that mattered in, in a very fundamental way, and it matters today. Um, because the, the, uh, the head of, the, I mean, I'll give you an example, uh, JMK, he was the governor that I mentioned earlier on. He was the American-backed governor who went and killed this person, Pai Muhammad. JMK was a school janitor before 1979. By the end of the Soviet occupation, he rose to become one of the most powerful people in southern Afghanistan and one of the richest people in southern Afghanistan, and not by accident, because he expertly, adroitly knew how to situate himself within the patronage flows that are coming from outside, from Pakistan, from, from Saudi Arabia, from CIA, whatever, okay? And, but it's important to understand that those patronage flows that went into John, to JMK, it wasn't purely just for his consumption. And certainly he got rich. Certainly he bought more land and he became a big land, uh, landlord. Okay? But it wasn't just for his consumption. He also reinvested the profits of patronage into the maintenance and extension of his organization as a Mujahideen organization. Meaning that he had hundreds or thousands of men to support, to pay their food. Uh, you know, he had to pay for their food. He had to pay for their ammo, for their weapons. And so the patronage flow is what enabled that to happen. As well, uh, in, in the same way, he distributed some of these funds, this patronage that came in from the CIA, to people out in the countryside, you know, uh, other tribal elders, etc., and used that to win their support. So in other words, his very position as a commander and as the most powerful person in southern Afghanistan depended, it hinged completely upon the flow of foreign, uh, foreign patronage into him. What that means is, well the, well, the question to ask then is, well, what happens if the money stops flowing? In his case, and I think in a lot of people's cases, well, if the money stops flowing, you can no longer pay all these towns of uh, fighters. You can no longer pay these other tribal elders and other, other people to support you. And it in, this, this sort of structure incentivizes the, the uh, uh, incentivizes people like JMK to try to convert the defunct patronage capital into actual political capital. And so people like, uh, people like him would make a play for political power. Now, I'm not saying this is the only reason people made a play for political power, and, and certainly there's others, but this is a sort of structural imperative that, that conditioned people's responses in a way that ma made it probabilistically likely that people would do this. And that's exactly what happened. So if you look at the Russians withdrew in 1989, a lot of people thought at the time that the, the, the state would collapse. It didn't collapse. The reason it didn't collapse is because uh, the Americans are supporting their proxies and the Russians are supporting their proxies. Americans are supporting the Mujahideen still for the next three years and the Russians are supporting uh, you know, the, the Afghan government for the next three years. But at the end of 1991, when the, the money flow stopped, when the patronage stopped, then all these commanders, and there's hundreds of people like JMK, all around the country were faced with a choice. If they wanted to continue at their position, if they wanted to continue their organization, they would have to try to convert their defunct patronage capital into political capital. And then often that's what they did. You had a brutal civil war in Kandahar, you had a brutal civil war in Urzgan, a brutal civil war in Kabul, 50, 60, 70,000 people were killed. Now, the reason I mention all of this is because um, we, we're today in a in somewhat similar situation. There's some differences, okay. Um, when I mentioned before, all these communities that were squeezed out of state access, many of them turned to the Taliban. If you look at the communities that enjoyed state access and foreign patronage access in Urzgan, people like JMK, um, there were some interesting differences between how that played out in the 80s and how it played out today. In the 80s, if you were somebody who enjoyed patronage access to Kabul, to the Soviets, um, you know, or in other words, that was the only source of patronage you had. Okay, it was the only source of resources you had. Today, however, U.S. money, by and large, 
bypasses the center of Kabul and goes into the periphery, into these sort of actors um, who, are, who are, for you know, want of a better term, warlords or commanders or militia leaders. You know. um, when I was last in Oruzgan province, uh, I think I counted there was 32 independent militias in Oruzgan. Oruzgan is not a very big place. I don't know how big it is, but it's not very big. It's, it's 32 independent militias. Some of them work for the special forces. Uh, some of them work for other private security companies. Some of them work, uh, some of them just have a little checkpoint on a street corner somewhere, and that's, they run that village, you know. Some of them are part of this uh, program that the United States has created called the Afghan Local Police. Um, and, and all of them depend existentially on the flow of patronage um, to, for everything that they do. And uh, the most prominent example of this is JMK, who is the former governor, who is now no longer the governor, his, his nephew, Matiullah Khan. Matiullah Khan is the police chief of Urzgan. He's also the most powerful person, I believe, in south, southern Afghanistan. He um, does a number of things, but the basis of his power, the, the core of his power, is on protecting American military uh, convoys or logistics um, that are going into U.S. bases from Kandahar City to Tarankot. And this maybe is like 100 miles or 80 miles or something like that. Just in that corridor, he provides men to protect that uh, convoy. And out of that, he's built an empire. And the obvious, he you know, has thousands of men. Uh, he, ha he supports all sorts of things. He has radio stations. You know, I was talking to a contractor last time I was in Afghanistan, and he was telling me that you cannot build anything uh, of substance in Tiran Kot without getting Matula's uh, permission. You know, that, that's the sort of power he wields. Um, but the obvious question to, to ask in all this is that his position depends on insecurity. Um, if there's no convoys to protect, if there's no bases to, to deliver, deliver logistics to, where does Matula stand? This is a similar question that was, that was faced by the Mujahideen in the 80s. And so the point here is that everything hinges upon, you know, people talk about uh, troop levels, people talk about... Um, number of bases. There's hundreds of bases around Afghanistan. Each of those bases have people who, who protect them. Most of them are private security companies. Um, you have, in many cases, you have militias that are protecting the convoys going into the, uh, private, uh, into the bases. And the question of what happens when the money ends, I think hopefully we'll try to get at that uh, today at the, at the panel, um, is not something that's being asked. Um, and it, it may be that the money won't end. It may be that it'll just be draw, draw down to some sort of manageable level and we'll have ordered chaos for the next number of years in perpetuity. Um, but maybe that the money will end and we'll have a repeat of 1992 when uh, people seek to convert their defunct patronage capital into political capital. We don't know, but I think posing the question at this point uh, is, is really important in trying to shift the narrative away from, I think, what I would say is a rather simplistic approach of looking purely at the number of troops on the ground and trying to take a more holistic look at uh, what the war in Afghanistan is really about. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to you, Matthew. Great. Uh, everyone can hear me okay? Um, I just want to raise a sole point of disagreement with Anand. As an Abdul Razik aficionado, I disagree that Matiola is the most powerful warlord in southern Afghanistan, but anyhow, um, my, uh, my talk is not going to contain a, narr a, a riveting narrative account, but it will contain a large number of obscure references to people and provinces in Afghanistan, so apologies. Um, I recently wrote two articles that I, uh, on, the, on this sort of subject that I wanted to uh, discuss a bit today. The first was an, a paper, actually, called Contracting the Commanders. It's about the political economy of transition and the private security industry in, in Afghanistan. Um, and that looks a bit at how um, not just, I mean, there's a political economy element of transition to it, but there's also, you know, it sort of looks at the com commander networks that Anand was talking about, how those actually became plugged into the private security industry in Afghanistan. Um, and the second, the second piece was uh, in the recent issue of Harper's, an article called Kabubble. And that is a sort of lurid portrait of booming wedding halls and empty factories and a city choking on informal, unplanned settlements and pollution and running out of water and a, uh, a, you know, a dream city being assembled on PowerPoint presentations in the desert that still exists only on PowerPoint presentations. Um, and that ends with probably my favorite uh, line that I've, kicker line that I've written yet in a piece, His Excellency President Karzai promised us which could be also a great title for a book. Um, 
But I promise that's my last cheap shot at Karzai. In fact, I think that uh, talking about political economy and this kind of structural analysis is a good way to uh, escape some of the pseudo-orientalist psychologizing of Karzai that passes for an analysis of you know, why we've arrived at the particular problems that we have, um, and instead looks at how some of the um, ways in which po the power and money are constructed in Afghanistan form the basis for the incentives and constraints that would um, bind anyone in Karzai's position. And, you know, how those are in turn related to some very deep contradictions in, in the international development and military uh, presence. So, um, what is political economy? Well, um, besides being a $10 word that my newspaper journalist friends laugh at me for using, uh, it's essentially about the way that politics and, and the economy interact and, and constitute each other uh, in a place like Afghanistan. Why is it important in Afghanistan? Well, let me just read a, a passage of facts um, that will, will give you a, a perhaps an understanding of why. Between 2001 and 2012, the United States spent $557 billion on the war in Afghanistan. While much of the spending went to purely military uses, by 2010, the international community's total development spending that year amounted to $15.7 billion, roughly equivalent to Afghanistan's GDP. According to the World Bank, Af the Afghan state is an extreme outlier in its aid dependency, with $9.4 billion in public spending in 2010 to 2011, compared to $1.65 billion in revenues. Two-thirds of civil ser servant salaries were paid directly by international donors. In effect, the international community ran a parallel state with 77% of all aid up to 2009 delivered with little or no Afghan government involvement in either decision making or delivery. So the point is, is that the international community is, the international community in terms of its spending, in both the development and military, is the largest actor um, and it's the largest contributor to the Afghan GDP. The second is opium. Um, there's another term that I want to introduce um, in the course of this talk. It's, it's about, called political settlements. And we're not actually talking about um, a political settlement in the sense the previous panel discussed. Uh, it's a term that refers to the bargain making um, between elites that you know, a, a certain body of literature be, believes to be much more important in understanding the stability and trajectory of uh, developing or, or failing uh, states than you know, any, any sort of uh, figures about civil servants or bureaucracy or troop strength or anything like that. So we're talking about the bargain making that constitute, that underpin uh, politics in Afghanistan. To give you a concrete example, uh, the best example that I can think of is Kabul Bank. Now you probably know the story of Kabul Bank where one billion dollars was, almost one billion dollars was siphoned off through insider crony loans. If you look at the networks behind Kabul Bank, they really um, provide a sort of diorama of the post-2001 political settlement that underpins uh, the, the order in Kabul. The most important of those networks are, you know, the southern, largely Kandahari, Pashtun networks around the new Ansari money markets, personified by Mahmoud Karzai, brother of President Karzai, and um, the northern Jamiati, Northern Alliance uh, link networks uh, around Hassin Fahim, the brother of Vice President Marshal Fahim. So these are, these are the two most powerful networks in the government in Afghanistan. And you, when you look at the case of Kabul Bank, you see how clearly uh, the very particular political economy and, and flow of resources post-2001 in Afghanistan has created these bedfellows. <clears throat> so um, basically what this is, is um, it's a sort of different way of looking at how things have worked out in Afghanistan than the sort of liberal state, uh, development state paradigm, you know, which talks about things like, again, troop numbers and when we think about what will happen after 2014, this line of analysis would argue that the bargain making and the um, political settlements and their stability or their reconfiguration or their, or their collapse are much more important to understanding the future of the country than you know, whether we hit the target for uh, ANSF um, recruitment or whether you know, there's a stable bureau and, and capacious bureaucracy uh, in Kabul. So um, let me just start. Uh, and, and I'll just say that this, I think this goes a lot further to explaining why things went wrong in Afghanistan than incompetence or uh, malice. So uh, let me just go quickly to um, the case of Kandahar province because I want to talk a bit about how the nature of the political economy of, inter of the international intervention 
helped to constitute the form of the Afghan state and many of the, the problems that we're seeing today. Now, in Kandahar, um, it sort of has a history as the, as the kingmaker province in Afghanistan. Um, of course, the Taliban got their start there, and Karzai and his family are from Kandahar. It's a very important place uh, for the country's politics. Now, post-2001, you had what was essentially, could be, you know, crudely characterized as a struggle between rival networks that were um, somewhat, you know, tribal in nature. And, uh, but based on patronage, sort of the kind of patronage and access to resources that Anand was talking about, commander networks. So you had two really important actors. One was the Barakzai tribe, led by Gulaga Shirzai, and one was the Popolzai tribe, led uh, more or less by Ahmed Wali Karzai, the brother of, of President Hamid Karzai. And Shirzai rode in literally on the back of the US uh, invasion. The CIA paid him to assemble militia, and he came out from Quetta and he seized control of the airport and managed actually to sabotage Karzai's preferred candidate, um, Mullah Naqib, from taking over governorship, who was sort of a, moder uh, a figure who could mediate between the Taliban who were being kicked out and the government. So instead, Shirzai seized control, you know, um, with the backing of, of the U.S. His men were involved, uh, you know, they were at the airport with U.S. Special Forces, heavily involved in c contributing intelligence toward the night raids that drove a lot of the these rival networks across the border and back into the Taliban that convinced many Taliban who had reconciled to um, take up the fight again. And he was also, you know, right in there with all the gravel contracts for the base and fuel contracts, making a ton of money in a very impoverished place. Suddenly there were millions of dollars in cash flowing around and Shirzai had the in on it and he was governor. But Ahmed Wali Karzai was, you know, no fool either and he got in with the CIA militia at Camp Gekko started providing men to what would be later become the Kandahar Strike Force, and he slowly worked his way, using his brother's connections and access to formal state instruments in Kabul and in a center to um, capture the key networks of patronage and uh, contracting that determined ground-level political power in Kandahar province. He eventually outmaneuvered Shirzai, pushed him out of the province, and since then it's been Karzai loyalists who've been governors. Um, now, what, 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 what happened here is that a peripheral political economy, so the presence of, um, let, me just, let me just tell you how much money was involved. In 2010, for example, the U United States dispersed nearly $276 million in Commander's Emergency Response Program funding in Kandahar out of a budget of $619 million for the entire country. That same year, the United States budgeted enough to portion $650 for every resident of Kandahar, some two or three times the per capita income. Of course, it did not get distributed in such a fashion. Um, but there was just tremendous amounts of money. That was the only game in Kandahar. And if you didn't have access to international patronage and U.S. military backing, as Anand mentioned, um, you would not be in charge for long. And so this is a phenomena that actually in, in, in some of the African scholarship has been um, analyzed in relation to warlordism and state collapse. Um, which is the relationship and the strategies of governance that get incentivized by the center when you have peripheral political economies like this, powerful per peripheral elites who, could, who have to be co-opted and undermined through a direct intervention in you know, private accumulation, whether it's contracting, whether it's the opium economy, whether it's private security companies and militias. And that results in a phenomenon that Bayar called the criminalization of the state whereby the state is not strong enough to use formal mechanisms to deal with these peripheral actors, but instead has to intervene in ways that we would call corrupt. And we saw that in Kandahar very clearly, that the state intervened to favor certain private actors so that they could become um, on top of the most powerful game in town, which again flowed from the nature and structure of the international intervention, dispersing all this money um, through the military and, and, and through the periphery. Um, okay, so I'll wrap this up by talking about the implications for transition, this sort of lens of analysis of political economy. Um, you know, like I mentioned, uh, aid has forged a sort of bought peace in Kabul today. It has, in, you know, Afghanistan is still fragmented among rival networks, but it has, you know, integrated or bound together many of those networks, as in the case of Kabul Bank, through the incentive of, of having access to this amount of money. But it's been at the expense of creating a rentier class in the cities, marginalizing rural areas, and heightening, heightening the sort of problematic center periphery dynamics that I just, just talked about with you. Um, and so now as you have this precipitous flow of money uh, out of the country, 
those bargains are going to be renegotiated and in many cases destabilized. Someone like Mati Allah, who, who depends on private security companies for his position of power in Orzgan province, is going to be destabilized. And, you know, that very often leads to uh, conflict. Um, now, there's a great World Bank report. I didn't want to talk too much about the macroeconomic picture because I think people understand that. It's a great World Bank report that Bill Byrd uh, was part of. I suggest you read that if, you, if you're curious about it. Um, but basically, their best-case scenario, if everything goes well, there will be um, sort of a stagnation of the economy and per capita uh, GDP growth will flatline uh, for the next 10 years. That's the best-case scenario if you crunch the numbers. Now, what I think this optimistic picture overlooks is that there'll be very sensitive, I mean, actually Ryan Crocker said it best when, he's, when someone asked him a sort of question like this, he's like, well, actually the aid wasn't that effective in the first place, so maybe it's precipitous withdrawal, it won't really be that bad. But, uh, this is the former ambassador to, to Kabul, US ambassador, but there are, are very politically sensitive microeconomies like the ones around private security where there'll be 70,000 armed men out of a job, a third of the Afghan security forces are due to be cut because the Afghan government can't afford it that could actually trigger uh, crises. On the other hand, um, it is true that there are some potentially positive uh, developments as a result of this. For one, it's going to reduce the rentier dynamics that have drastically hampered the development of uh, Afghanistan's economy, civil society, and politics, democratic politics, let's say. Um, and it might open the way for, or at least Force, it'll force new bargains and new negotiations, and it might open the way for new political settlements that are more inclusive and especially more reliant on popular mobilization and accountability. Because in a rentier society, power flows from the top, from donors or from individuals in, in the field who are siphoning off you know, some aspect, whether it's private security or opium. It doesn't flow from people. It doesn't flow from average Afghans. So in a, in a sense, average Afghans are actually going to be empowered politically by um, this. And, um, you know, that's, so that's, that's one possibility. But I would be remiss um, not to close on a dark and foreboding note of pessimism. <laughs> when, um, when, in, 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 when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, now this is, comparison is flawed in many ways, but hear me out, the, they left behind a larger and much more um, functioning, functional uh, bureaucracy and military and intelligence service and a far more cohesive political elite that actually had an ideology. Um, but none of those things ended up mattering because the structure of the political economy of the country was inherently unstable. And Najib hung on despite everyone's, the, the, former, the com, former communist president of Afghanistan, hung on despite everyone's expectations for a couple of years. But what did him in was in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed, the funding to Afghanistan that was paying for the state, that was paying for the militias, that was paying for the army, stopped. And you had big, you, these big huge militias in, in the north, Dostum and, and, and Nadari militias, as well as others, that turned on Najib's government. And that was the final trigger for a, a full state collapse and devastating uh, civil war. So it, it's worth keeping in mind um, the way that these kind of inherently unstable structural issues can dramatically change the course of uh, a country's fate. Thanks. Thanks very much. I, I actually thought you might end on optimism, but you corrected yourself. Told you there. So we're on it over to you. Um, thank you, Bill, and thank you, SIP, for inviting uh, me to speak, and um, welcome also to our online participants who are watching the webcast. Um, this is a very important topic, and um, I don't know if I can do it justice in 15 minutes. Um, I think the two last two presenters have made some very interesting observations. Um, and I, I, I think I you know, want to pick up later on what Bill said in his opening about um, the importance of confidence. Um, I am an economic advisor at USAD um, on both the Afghanistan and Pakistan program. And, you know, in economics, it's known as the dismal uh, science. And um, so it's ironic that I probably, you know, would be the one with a more optimistic um, view um, of the panel. But um, let me just um, back up as, you know, these um, other panelists have and, and, you know, talk about two years ago, 
when we uh, consider this issue of the transition and what it mean for the economy. There was a lot of fear um, and, you know, the bank was starting to do its um, study and then we also um, had our own research agenda to look at um, both, you know, um, the ec economic growth prospects as well as the fiscal gap um, or the country financing gap, and some would say. So we looked at the experience of other similar countries um, who were post-conflict, had some, you know, large uh, troop presence and um, also, you know, large amounts of aid. And then, you know, what happened after those withdrawals? And we look at each of those scenarios, you know, in each of those countries. And then we looked specifically at the Afghanistan side, um, you know, the economy, the sectors, um, the major indicators of, of concern, um, you know, the unemployment possible and um, GDP growth and such. And, you know, on the economic side, um, Matthew is right, you know, the World Bank report, which Bill um, was a key author of, is, um, I think, more optimistic than um, some of the doom and gloom that you've heard in uh, off and on. And the basis of that is that, you know, security and political concerns, you know, are an, an assumption, you know, if there's some consistency there. But um, the major sectors that are important for future growth are agriculture and the services sector. Um, so, for instance, you know, um, this year, I mean, in 2012, actually, um, agricultural growth and services sector growth, um, the World Bank projects there will be a 10% GDP growth overall. So that's, that's beyond everyone's expectations, and it's sort of, con I think, is contrary to what someone would have thought would be the trend, which would be a downward trend. So I wanted to point that out. But we also looked at the fiscal gap, and there was a big concern there in terms of the government being able to cover its expenses and what that would mean for um, operations and public services and, and how that would affect the citizenry. Because um, over the past you know, 10 years, um, and I'd like to say with a lot of USAID assistance, um, there have been major development gains that are, you know, objective, you know, and, um, and verifiable. And so, you know, given, you know, in the big picture, the importance of Afghanistan, um, both from a national security perspective, it's still an important focus of ours, but also for um, sustaining those types of gains, um, we wanted to address, you know, that physical gap. So, you know, think about where the country was 10 years ago. Um, back then there were only 900,000 boys in school and now we can say there are 8 million kids in school and 37% of them are girls. Um, the life expectancy has increased by 15 to 20 years. And for women um, who are a vulnerable part of the population, you know, they, that means a, a life expectancy of from 44 years to now 62 years. So that is very significant and, you know, of great value in terms of both, you know, um, um, the economic um, contribution as well as sort of just the human, you know, value. Um, other kinds of contributions that we've made were uh, the increase in GDP, you know, it's, it's fivefold now from, from 10 years ago, averaging 9% a year, which is just uh, a very remarkable thing given that other countries other poor countries are going about 6% or 5% on average. Um, and then also the increase of electricity access um, has increased threefold from 6% to 18% of the population. So just in total, you know, we, we, we see that we have been able to make a difference with the aid that we uh, provided to Afghanistan over the last decade. And it's very important to sustain those um, successes. But, you know, Afghanistan is, is still um, a place with uh, many challenges. And so um, with the transition, we had to think about what are the ways that we can mitigate some of the potential negative impacts that we did find in our studies. And then also think about 
positioning Afghanistan in a way to um, best um, pursue inclusive and sustainable growth for the medium and long term. So what we did, um, I think, um, might, you know, you think is pretty um, maybe logical would be to think about our programs in the economic growth sector and think about what are the clearest objectives, you know, that would meet those kind of needs. So we, we are now focused on jobs, on revenue, food security. Um, we are looking at the most productive sectors, agriculture, mining, trade, services, light manufacturing. And let me mention that services, you know, we, we are also introducing some innovations there that are important for not just inclusive growth, but um, for um, changing some of these political economy dynamics. And I'll speak about that in a little bit more if I have time, but, you know, the, the idea that um, Afghanistan was the same in terms of, you know, societal patterns and networks that as it was in the Soviet era, post-Soviet era, or even the Taliban era, I think is, is, um, is wrong because, you know, the changes just demographically, you have this huge youth population now in Afghanistan who's been exposed to, you know, different ideas and um, to modern technology. 60% of Afghans now use mobile phones. Women are more um, active in society and the economy. Um, you have roads. And all this adds up to a more mobile, a more autonomous um, society of individuals that can help break that, that problem of patronage networks. And the, and the idea of patronage networks is not uncommon in developing countries. In, in many poor countries, it's a common problem. But some of these modern ideas and modern um, instruments um, have really done um, a lot to move the ball forward in terms of introducing um, personal agency and different ways of, of networking. Although social networks are still important, um, I think that you know, that kind of modernization, um, understanding the difference is, is very important. But um, again, um, when we, going back to some of the things that we're pursuing, um, you know, we also understand, you know, given the fiscal gap um, that we identified and the World Bank identified, um, there was going to be a more important role for private sector investment. So, we're also working on that front with trying to build small and medium enterprises in Afghanistan, um, linking up um, Afghan businesses um, to um, regional businesses and opportunities. So that's um, the new Silk Road vision that you might have heard us talk about before in other forums. Um, we are also trying to per, um, pursue with Afghanistan um, WTO accession by 2014, and um, that you know, it's a very remarkable goal if, if they're able to do it, you know, in time. On the fiscal side, um, as, as Bill said, you know, confidence is very important. And the lessons of history are also important. Um, when the government um, was not receiving funds from the Soviets, you know, back at that time, there was um, some uh, correlation that was drawn out to the collapse of the government, right? So, you know, the Tokyo Pledge um, in, in July of last year, um, I think was important to the international community and the Afghans in terms of understanding what the future could be. 16 billion through um, 2015, um, I think is a substantial commitment. And it's a way of also demonstrating that we understand, you know, the shortage, um, and, you know, the revenue shortage, you know, they've had remarkable revenue growth um, since 20, uh, 2002, 20%, I think, over a year, each year. Um, so even with that remarkable um, revenue growth, they're still going to have a shortage. And we understand then um, the importance of providing assistance through transition and beyond and providing a glide path so that, you know, they can get um, adjusted to um, this um, new reality. Um, additionally, I think what was very important at Tokyo, too, was our um, work on mutual accountability with the government. And that means, um, you know, for 
the extra assistance that we're providing, there has to be some sort of commitment to reforms in, term, and in terms of economic reforms, in terms of guaranteeing rights for women, and, um, and in turn, in addition to you know, the aid, we'll, put, um, we'll, we'll be honoring some, some other pledges, such as the Kabul um, Conference Pledge to put um, on budget 50% of our development assistance, and to align our assistance with a, at least 80% of our assistance with the national um, priority programs, the NPPs, and we've done that. We've done you know, more than 80%. Um, in addition to the types of you know, program changes that we've made and the commitments, I also wanted to talk about the way that we're doing um, and delivering um, that assistance. And we're, we've now focused on um, working in, in terms of four principles. Results, partnership, accountability, and sustainability. Um, I've spoken already about some of these results. Um, the sustainability, you know, is, is something that is embodied in the objectives that we've um, put out, which are jobs, revenue, and food security. Um, the partnership, I think, is also, you know, something very important for this topic of, you know, the political economy. Um, as I've said, we've committed to put, you know, 50, at least 50 percent of our development assistance on budget. Um, and this will allow the government, um, you know, to better execute on their own some of these um, project priorities that they have. So this has been ongoing, and I think this demonstrates that, you know, we are in a partnership with the government and that they are not excluded from decision making. Um, there are also specific programs that we have on the economic side where we're working with specific ministries, the Ministry of Mines, on mine tenders, the Ministry of Finance on capacity building, um, the Ministry of Commerce and, and, and Industry on W-2 accession. So there are specific um, partnerships that we have with these uh, different government entities, and we're trying you know, to advance a shared agenda. Um, I'd also like to point out, too, that our partnership extends to the private sector, because the private sector investment in Afghanistan has been, you know, pretty, you know, minimal. And I, I think that, you know, with this adjustment in the economy and the shifts that will need to be made, um, the private sector is going to have to be, you know, very aggressive in promoting jobs and also trying to create income. But let me just pause there by, by saying that this is where I think confidence again comes um, into play. Um, and that is part of the political economy, I think, too, because part of it is, you know, even if I give you as many statistics as, you know, I know and can remember um, about the economy, uh, there's something that economists talk about and that, that's, you know, Keynes coined as um, animal spirits. And we see that in the ups and downs of stock markets. When bad news comes out, um, people react and the stock market may go down. If bad, you know, good news, and then, you know, the stock market may go back up. So I think that there is sort of an X factor here in the way that we um, talk to our Afghan partners and how we interact with them and how we talk about the future. So the confidence that we, you know, provide in our actions and our in our words, and I think is, is going to be very important in sort of influencing the mindsets of the elites, of the decision makers, um, of everyday Afghans, and how they feel about their society and the, the progress of their country. So I think overall that, you know, we, we really need to do, pay close attention to the data um, and understand the economy. The economy has to shift, sectors have to shift. We have to find more sustainable um, sources of growth. But, you know, the big picture is that Afghanistan still matters. And um, I think, you know, from the U.S. government side that we have tried, you know, to refocus ourselves in terms of the, what we do as well as how we do things so that, you know, we can communicate, you know, the, the commitment to the future, you know, about transition and beyond. So um, with that, Bill, I'd like to just conclude. Thank you very much. At least one panelist uh, struck a slightly optimistic note. And uh, I very much appreciate, uh, Barani, that you put out the fiscal gap because 
uh, whereas the bank report was somewhat moderately or cautiously, or not too pessimistic on the economy per se, uh, it was very alarmist about the fiscal gap, and I would agree. I also tend to, to agree, I mean, some of the criticisms of the aid system in Afghanistan are, are very well placed, but the only point I want to make is that it's, it's not there that most of the action is. And when you look at the bulk of the money that was talking, it was defense related, it was international military expenditure, stabilization funding, not the sort of traditional development aid. However many problems it may have, including uh, from my former institution, the World Bank, I don't think uh, any, any sensible person could say that that was the main reason for all the problems Afghanistan faces. Uh, the other presentation is very interesting, talking from local warlords to Kabul Bank. Now, Kabul Bank, very interesting, right? Where, where was that theft? That was the theft of Afghan private citizens' money. And then when the bank collapsed, the government took over, which is no different from what's been happening all over Europe and, I believe, was it Ireland? Ireland, where there was one country where, surprise, I think it was Ireland where actually the government took on the debts of the banks and everybody was surprised that they just didn't let them default. Uh, so, so, you know, I just wanted to, I, it seems like I would guess the patronage system is equal opportunity where there's a chance to nab Afghan, the Afghan people's own money, like their bank deposits, they also take that opportunity too. Um, very, I, I do want to make a few points and then open it up to questions. Uh, but, uh, you know, one thing I think on, on the money will decline. I think there's no question about it. And when I was talking about troop numbers, I wasn't thinking of that as purely from a security point of view, but the number of bases, the number of troops, money will just decline with that. It's, it's an empirically sort of verifiable process. And so you'll have fewer bases, uh, patronage being dispensed in much uh, less. I, I don't see a repeat of the 1980s when the U.S. government would massively fund local warlords in Afghanistan for whatever reason. I, I just, separately from the involvement of the government, I just don't see, so I think the money will decline. Uh, I would want to flag though, you know, there's well-established economic theory that, that when people get a windfall and they know it's a windfall, it doesn't affect their behavior that much. And surely these very smart actors must have known that a lot of this money was temporary and that they would take advantage of it to the best possible. Many have built fortunes should they be surprised? Uh, you argued they would change their behavior. I think it's an interesting question. They, it, cer it certainly shouldn't be surprising to them. And you know, when you have a windfall and it goes away, the real question is, has it started to affect consumption decisions and actual behavior? And particularly, I think the question is relevant in the lower levels of the patronage network. But you know, the top guys, they've, they've done so well, uh, they probably have an interest in stability. Anyway, it's an interesting subject to, discuss, to, do, to talk about. Then the other point I want to make is that the relative importance of different flows will change. Drugs like, will, in relative terms, at least increase because the other flows are, are decreasing. Uh, interestingly, domestic revenue. Now 10% of GDP, that's pretty respectable for any low-income country. Uh, that may be adversely affected because some of the aid-related revenues may go down, but it's still going to be very substantial, and relatively that, that chunk of about a billion and a half dollars will be important. Uh, and similarly, if, uh, as Barani was saying, more aid goes to the government on budget, you, you actually see, so, so one possibility is that more of the aid, the financial inflows, other than drugs, but the rest of them will be more centralized, more concentrated. Does that give an opportunity for you know, more divisive patronage by the center or more possibly more inclusive. At least it will be in one place and nominally parliament votes on the budget. And that would become more like a sort of a normal patronage in countries that have actually made successful transitions where you have all sorts of corruption and imperfections, but you have some kind of national uh, level inclusive patronage. So uh, I'll, with that, I think I'll, I'll open it up to questions and uh, please just, uh, State your, state your name and where you're working uh, before you ask the question. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking for hands. Uh, we have one. <coughs> right. Thank you all for your comments. Uh, my name is Megan Catt with CNA. And one of the panelists, I think it was you, Matthew, mentioned the large amount of SERP that was in Kandahar at one point. SERP has since 
decrease um, quite a bit. And I'm wondering if we've already started to see any kind of impact on these patronage networks that you had referred to. Um, maybe you can go ahead and answer that, Matt, while yeah, yeah, other sure. people uh, are thinking. There, um, there hasn't been a dramatic uh, reconfiguration of patronage networks um, immediately, but there was really not a lot of data actually about what's been happening post SERP. So um, it remains to be seen, I think, you know, whether uh, this will result in certain um, groups or networks fragmenting. Like, for, for example, um, you know, in Kandahar right now, you have a uh, sort of crisis between the Karzai brothers over the question of the Inomina housing development, which in turn, I think, you know, we're Basically, there's this housing development outside of Kandahar um, where housing prices, there's a housing bubble in it. And so, I mean, economically, you've seen serious effects of, of SERP contracting being withdrawn. So, you know, there's been a crash in the housing bubble outside of Kandahar uh, in Inomina, which is certainly re related to the dr decline in U.S. military contracting. But politically, I don't think we've seen a dramatic shift yet. Hi, my name is Anshuman Apte, and uh, I'm with Voice of America Afghanistan Service, TV Ashna. My question is to all four speakers, um, including uh, Mr. Moderator. Basically, you mentioned the challenges, you know, uh, reduction in the flow of money and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a lot of talk about uh, mining sectors and you know other uh, sectors of the economy as being kind of the buffers uh, leading up to the transition and post 2014. If you all of you could very short you know give a short note on what are the measures that could be taken uh, to prevent all of this from happening or to to save the Afghan economy uh, moving ahead uh, post 2014. Thank you. Uh, Barani, you want to start? Um, yes. So for those not familiar with um, discussion on this sector, um, some USGS and other sources have identified what may be a, a trillion dollars worth of minerals um, in Afghanistan. Um, you know, the problem is getting that those minerals out and to market. And that's when you can actually capitalize on, you know, those natural resources. Um, so there have been two major contracts, one for a copper, one for an iron ore um, mined, um, INAC and Hajigak, and um, one was won by a Chinese company and another one by an Indian can Canadian conglomerate. Um, there has since been some uh, uh, difficulties in getting the mining law past and that has created some investor um, worry about you know th their ability to um, get their return on investment in Afghanistan so you know on the USAID side we understand that mining can be um, you know a future source of, of significant revenue for the country um, so the, the, the minerals you know those are going to be a tougher um, um, subsectors maybe to to capitalize on in the in the short to medium term. Um, however, we are seeing that um, the oil and gas um, resources are going to be much easier to bring online. Um, they don't require as intensive infrastructure investment. So um, when those do come online, and we're assisting the Ministry of Mines, as I mentioned, um, with um, building financial systems, understanding how to contract and do tenders and um, you know helping with that economic governance, um, then I think that could be a, a more um, immediate source of revenue. You wanna uh, co confidence. We just have to have lots of confidence, and um, you know, as long as the Afghans can maintain confidence uh, in themselves and in us, things should be fine. Uh, we need to end the war, 
and uh, that means we need to have a political settlement in all sense of, of the term and uh, end the hostilities. Uh, the, you know, in addition to what, what Ms. Penn said, you can't have a functioning state, you can't have a functioning economy in a real substantive way when there's the, a war as it's happening right now going on in which no side can actually win. You need to have a settlement. Uh, just on, back on the mining question, I, I will advertise that I wrote a paper, a short paper on this subject for USIP at the end of uh, last month. So that gives my views. Uh, many economists, when you hear about mining, or you, 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 you shudder because you, there's a well-known arguments about the resource curse. And you look at countries uh, that have developed mineral, underground mineral resources, and it's not at all clear they perform better than other countries. There, and there are some horrifying examples. I think one of them is Nigeria, as well as DRC. But in Nigeria, the economic modeling suggests the country would have been better off in absolute terms by not developing its, its, its oil resources. In other words, it actually, because it, of course, I mean, there's the macro effect, so immediately existing coffee exports, other crop exports stop. The economy becomes dependent on oil. Uh, there are governance implications, and as you can see in Nigeria, there are uh, conflict implications. In Afghanistan, I think the way I look at it is there are these very big ticket resources like copper and iron ore, and my suspicion there is the main effect of all the political economy aspects and problems is not necessarily going to be more conflict or corruption, but just simply delays. And so anybody who's counting on those resources to replace resources from the U.S. Treasury any time in the next 10 or 20 years is, I think, is misplaced confidence. And then there are the smaller ones, which we didn't talk, but a lot of them have political economy and conflict implications. And, and I would also just give a cautionary note on the private sector. Uh, I sort of learned this lesson early when, when we asked some people to do work on, on a couple of raisins and carpets and things like that, very small-scale activities. Uh, the most recent example I heard was the U.S. DOD funding a chromite crusher for, for actually a, a local head of the, of the Afghan local police or basically some kind of local militia. And so you can get these very weird interactions which are certainly going to distort and possibly increase the risk of conflict because the traditional people involved in chromite smuggling in that area were not the same guy who was the, the head of the local police. So I would just be very cautious on it. I, I would go back to what are Afghanistan sort of fundamental resources and clearly uh, it's high, uh, high value agriculture, labor intensive agriculture crops other than opium obviously. And, uh, and for that also you need water development, you need irrigation and uh, expansion of water conservancy. Uh, if there, are there, if the, I think in a way people are giving their closing points certainly uh, I think you were, uh, but uh, if, there, if uh, we have one more question. I don't want to prolong this, if it, particularly if it's snowing outside. So we have two more questions. Uh, first, down here, and then up there. Thank you. Uh, Ajman Ghani from the Afghanistan Council. Uh, Mr. Gopal, you uh, mentioned uh, the incidents in 2002. There is a government. There are laws. It's not implemented. As simple as that. It's bad governance. Um, and there's no lack of capacity in Afghanistan. The wrong people are in charge. The reason why I'm telling you this is since you mentioned 2002, in the early days in Afghanistan, there were a series of reforms that were implemented in the early days. Ministry of Finance, Urban Development, Telecom Sector. And then after the 2004 election, the president start, you know, decided to go the wrong way. Um, and that's why you have the warlords in charge, some of the remnants of the uh, Northern Alliance that are in charge, and they're pillaging the country. It's a very simple concept that the Afghans understand on that. Um, and, and, and again, uh, I go back to the international community for you, Matthew. You know, you coined some words. I think Afghanistan, World War II and a half. Uh, 48 countries had physical presence in the country. And to spend $15 billion in development, according to your numbers, over 10 years is absolutely nothing. It was one, one year. Oh, you said one year. I thought you said over the years. So it's a $15 billion. I, I haven't seen those numbers. Um, but to spend $276 million in one year in Kandahar, that's what you said, is outrageous. But $15 billion over a period of 10 years while you have a development in Dubai that they spend $4 billion, $4 billion in one development compared to Afghanistan is nothing. 
seriously. So it, it, it really has issues, and unless in 2014 the right people are in charge of Afghanistan, the economy is not going to move forward. We're not going to have all these, you know, positive things that you have said. Um, the one thing that, you know, surprised me is that I heard the private sector only once in this panel. The role of the private sector, what can private sector do, what it has done, and what it should it do. Uh, everybody's talking about the private sector, the Silk Road Initiative and all that, but nobody's giving us any details on the matter. Um, Senator Kerry said yesterday that um, foreign policy is economic policy. Well, there's not an Afghanistan. Uh, I would suggest we get all the rest of the questions and then the panelists can respond and also close. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Jeff Riley, Contract Support to the Marine Corps Center for Regular Warfare. Um, you mentioned Nigeria, and, and China is very active in, in providing both aid and direct assistance to uh, natural resource development in Africa. And my curiosity is, uh, what have you, anybody in the panel, heard about uh, Chinese aid uh, natural, in terms of development of natural resources? Uh, to a lesser extent, Russia and Iran, but China primarily because they often don't have the pesky accountability, accountability standards and human rights linkages that Western aid uh, often has. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, yes, one, Marvin. Uh, Marvin Boybell, Middle East Institute. What does the transition mean for the opium trade? How is that going to change, if at all? If, uh, please, Michael, go ahead. Should, should we attach any caveats to the claim that Afghanistan has enjoyed a, an unprecedented boost in the standard of health of its population in the spirit of uh, anti-Panglossianism. <laughs> okay, we've got a rich set of questions. Uh, I'll let each panelist take whichever one they want. I guess I'll speak at the end in case some of them weren't answered. And should we go uh, in reverse order? Barani, do you want to close and respond? Thank you. Um, sure. Um, I'd like to focus on the private sector because I do think that's very important. And um, despite, again, you know, the negative press, negative attitudes, um, Afghanistan has been a resilient country. It's endured decades of violence, of conflict, and it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. Um, you know, it's there is definitely challenges, and um, for those who go and work there, you know, and um, there are quite a, a number of Afghan Americans who have gone back um, to work in Afghanistan. Um, and we made, we've met with them. Um, one of these um, major um, chambers, the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce, um, they hold these annual matchmaking conferences trying to um, link up businesses uh, in the U.S. to businesses in Afghanistan. Um, we've supported a, a delegation of women entrepreneurs to the Delhi um, summit, um, in, you know, in the summer last year, um, you know, as a way of, of introducing them to um, outside opportunities and, and, and highlighting opportunities in Afghanistan. Um, and recently, a colleague of mine led a, um, a franchise conference into Afghanistan, bringing um, American companies, you know, um, Radio Shack, Ace, um, to look at, you know, the opportunities in Afghanistan. And there was, there was very, a very positive reception to, um, um, to that conference, and you can read about it in Newsweek and um, I think Business Week and a, a few other um, journals. Um, but their reaction, you know, some of the comments that we got back was, were that, you know, these, these folks didn't know Afghanistan very well, and they had to be shown some of the specifics of how the, you know, businesses operate and what the rules are and such. So um, there was more optimism than we had thought um, possible. And so there will be some deals made out of that conference that we're hopeful for. But you're right, the private sector plays an important role, and we want to make sure that they are able to make the contribution that they should be making because Afghanistan has to rely more on a dynamic 
economy, um, and and so that's that's where, in my mind, you know, that's where I'm focused on. Thank you. So, with regards to the Chinese, um, they're they're definitely very active, in, especially in the mining sector, um, and they also sell. It's a big market for them. They're, they they're selling a lot of goods there. Um, there was an interesting article recently, which you could probably find on Google, from a guy at a Chinese a think tank in Beijing, but he, he was Westerner, which was sort of pointing out that actually the Chinese, um, you know, we, we, like, we often think of them as having these Machiavellian designs in Afghanistan, but it was sort of saying that it seems like the Chinese are in a bit over their head with some of the deals they signed at INAC, and actually some of the delays and concerns about archaeological uh, findings there might be because they're realizing that the deal wasn't as sweet, um, and it was just pointing some of the chaos and confusion on at, at, the, at the MCC, which is a Chinese corporation there. Um, Marvin, that's a great question about opium. It is a, it's a huge question that very, gets very little attention. I'll tell you what, though, it, it's the, the pro-government actors have done an amazing job of cleaning up uh, the opium trade. Uh, I mean, it's booming, but they've, they've cleaned up uh, on the action. I was in Helmand. Um, in the fall, and Southern Helmand has been, you know, amazingly pacified. The Marines have just stomped on the Taliban, built roads everywhere. Uh, you can drive around. Of course, it's still producing. You know, if it was a country, it would produce most of the world's opium. And they, you know, a lot of the um, people there explained to me how the U.S.'s uh, counterinsurgency campaign has allowed, empowered the, the local police to um, basically monopolize the opium trade and push out the Taliban and, and, and rival smugglers. Um, so, with regards to um, Panglossian uh, narratives, you know, it, it's very easy to be a critic, and I really I, I admire people who are trying to do something constructive for Afghanistan. That's not that's not my job. My job is to is to be a critic. So, in in that vein, the question, you know, if you if you leave the cities in Afghanistan, you'll find a tremendous amount of of brutal pro poverty. Uh, and, and deprivation in the rural areas, particularly those that have been affected by our war there. And a lot of the statistics, for example, about access to health care um, are misleading because they don't, they're, it's about, you know, a district having a health care center in it when most of the population can't get access to it. But that aside, the question for me is not whether, you know, if you set aside the tremendous amount of waste and corruption and violence, some progress or, or significant progress has been made over the last 10, 11 years, but whether the bill for that progress has yet to come due, and whether we've set up insuperable um, structural dilemmas uh, that will, you know, like Kabul's declining water table and choked uh, streets, one day come due when, you know, the Afghans are the ones who, who mostly have to, have to deal with it. So that's the, that's the perspective. It's not about where the country's at now. It's about what, what really is its future um, in development terms and political terms. Um, yeah, thanks. In response to your question, uh, there's a, there is a government in Afghanistan, but there's no state in Afghanistan. This is the problem. And by state, I mean in the most simple barbarian sense of a body that has a monopoly over the means of violence. That doesn't exist in Afghanistan. And if you look over the last three decades, w what's actually happened is a process of failed state formation or an attempt at state formation. So we need to recast all of these questions in terms of the question of state formation. It, it, you know, what does a victory look like in Afghanistan? A victory in Afghanistan would be a state, would be an organ a body that has a monopoly over the means of violence. That would be a victory in my, in my eyes, okay? That would mean uh, negotiated settlements and all, the, all these other things, troop withdrawal, okay? But that, that I think, is a sort of sine qua non of, a, you know, beyond anything else we talk about, this is what we have to uh, start with. Uh, with um, Chinese development, uh, you know, it was interesting because I, I um, last time I was in Afghanistan, I went to Wardak province, and it was surprising to me because I was driving along the road to Jalrez uh, district in Wardak, and over there, there was uh, every four or five miles, you saw a little outpost, and it was all Chinese workers, uh, and I don't even know what they were doing there. They were working on something, and it was surprising to me. I didn't recognize beyond, beyond Dainak, you know the extent to which the Chinese are involved in Afghanistan. However, um, the question of human rights is, uh, again, I don't think that's necessarily the right question, because if we are worried about human rights in Afghanistan, we should start with the people that we are allied with before we worry about anybody else. Um, and as I mentioned before in my, my comments, I mean, there's, there's a lot of actors we can start to focus on uh, in that regard. Uh, and finally, uh, with Michael's uh, question, just to, just to uh, go off what um, Matthew said is, uh, you know, 900,000 boys in school before and 8 million kids today. I mean, all these numbers, I believe, are fantasies. Uh, they're not true. 
um, they are make-believe. And, uh, you know, in 2010, during the parliamentary elections, uh, there was a lot of uh, polling centers that were assigned to schools. And I was with the U.S. military in Warnak and Logar province, and I, I, we were going out, they got the GPS coordinates for these, for these, uh, from the Ministry of Education to, to go to these schools to open a polling center. So we went there. None of them existed. They're all make-believe. You know, this is all on paper. You know, uh, you can't trust any of these numbers. As Matthew said about with, the, with health centers, you know, the, it's the equivalent of saying that, you know, the, the actual numbers, I think, is like 90 or 85 percent of Afghans have access to health in Afghanistan. What that means is there's, a, there's some sort of health facility in their district. And if you look at anything about Afghanistan, a district is a big, mountainous and rugged place. It's the equivalent of saying that every county in the United States has a doctor's office, and therefore everybody in the United States has access to health care or has health care. It's, it's, it is sophistry. This is not actually what's actually happening on the ground in Afghanistan. We need to go away from these sorts of numbers because we don't know. We, nobody knows what, what's a life expectancy. Nobody's actually able to survey in a war zone and find out what these numbers are, right? So that, those aren't the metrics I think that we should, we should look at. We should actually look at, in the most basic level, what's required for Afghanistan, for us to walk away and say Afghanistan is better off than we found it. The most basic level is there's a state in Afghanistan. This is why I think the political economy that we're talking about here today is so important, because you can't separate these two questions. Well, thank you. I Actually, you, you, between you, you covered uh, all the questions. I'll, I'll add just a few points that, I, that occurred to me. I, I, you know, on the point on confidence in private sector, the only money which I think would replace in sheer amount the volume of aid and military expenditures is the private capital that's been built up largely by Afghans over the last 10 years, and a lot of it is sitting in Dubai or elsewhere. So. You know, if, if you if Panglossian view would be if there's a political settlement and end to the conflict, a lot of that money will come back and the econ the Afghan economy would would take off. Uh, so, so you know, confidence or not, but but you know, people are all worried about direct foreign investment. And everything that'll be the last thing that comes in when Afghans start investing, then the foreigners will follow. And and uh, I you know I haven't seen particularly reliable numbers, but it's well in the billions of dollars of Afghan private capital in places like Dubai. And, and I think improving confidence, they would be quite willing to, to invest back. Uh, on the China, it's, it's, it's an interesting issue. Actually closer to home, there's something called the Sindak copper mine uh, in Pakistan, in Baluchistan province. And it's a disaster story uh, basic, invested by the Chinese. So, uh, I do think the Afghan government negotiated rather successfully and got a good deal out of the Chinese, which is perhaps one of the reasons why the Chinese are, are delaying. I think they may also be waiting. And a, a very good strategy on the part of the Chinese would be a preemptive winning the bid and then delaying as long until, you know, just to make sure nobody else has the resource. So there are a lot of issues going on, which again goes back to my point that these major resources, the main result is likely to be delays rather than corruption and conflict. Uh, opium, that's a huge question and uh, worth a whole other uh, area. I do think the point made, to the extent that opium production has been suppressed due to the presence of international trade, that constraint is obviously going to be relaxed. So, so we should be prepared for increases and again, not blame it on the Afghan government or somebody. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the picture. And in, in a way, there's been an artificial depression, which only may only last as long as the international troops. And on health, uh, I actually think, uh, Michael, you might have been referring to the recent household survey. So it's not this thing about access, which just says how many hours walk you are from a facility, but it's actual survey data. I, I was shocked when I saw it. The life expectancy went up to 60 years and the infant mortality went down. I had, have a lot of trouble believing those data. I've, I've uh, you know, health people in the World Bank and other thing have looked at it and, uh, you know, it's, it obviously does not cover the South very well. Uh, and so, so it obviously has some weak, weaknesses, but if you correct for those, I mean, there's clearly no question there have been huge improvements in health standards and also increases in education. I think those are all genuine. Keep in mind that some of the work suggested that these things are really not that closely like, linked to success and transition. There's been a boom in education and in health indicators improving around the world, including deepest conflicts in Africa. So, so the idea that somehow because of all this progress in health, in education and health, somehow that will 
set the basis for a successful transition. No, I think it's these political economy. It may mean there is something to protect, but I don't know. That will not dominate the geopolitical issues. I, I, so I, I do think we come back to these political economy issues, which I feel are very central, and I feel we've just scratched the surface. In a way, there's an agenda for further work set up by this, building on a lot of very good work on local power and political dynamics, but maybe trying to link that to thinking about how the changing financial flows might affect these. Uh, so thank you uh, to the panel, and thanks for participating on what I guess is probably a snowy day today, and uh, we appreciate your <laughs>